So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover the um, score and LTV requirements, how to access the HUD guidelines, which believe it or not, a lot of people don't know how to do that. We're going to go over that which loans require manual underwriting, the credit requirements, what qualifies in as, as an extenuating circumstance, what housing is needed, what if they're rent free, what do they need in reserves, DTI caps, what about no score borrowers, and then we're going to take some questions, and by the way, I do want you to enter your questions as we go so I don't have to hold you guys up after the call, and then we're going to do pricing examples, and um, I'm going to show you a little bit about our marketing studio, so let's get started. So this is going to be the only overlay I tell you this entire training. Um, our minimum requirement for a manual is 580. HUD actually goes lower than that. We don't. So that is the first and only overlay that you're going to hear on this call. Everything else is coming straight from HUD. By the way, we do no score loans and those are manual underwrites as well. So we'll touch on that. FHA allows up to 96.5% on a purchase. You can go over that on the CLTV in situations like down payment assistance. And as you know, we have some great in-house down payment assistance programs um, and we do manuals on those too. So if you're interested in DPA, um, definitely listen up because sometimes those do refer and you want to know what to do and how to get those closed in that case. Rate and term up to 97.75, cash out to 80, and then if there's a second, up to 85% combined loan to value. Those are the HUD guidelines on max LTVs. So this is super, super, super and important. And if you don't listen to one thing on this call, listen to this part. Um, where are the HUD guidelines? A lot of people think that you need a password for them or only underwriters have access or something like that. That is not the case. The HUD guidelines are there for you to see. You can access them anytime. What's great about going straight to the HUD handbook is that you don't have to wait on your AE or your underwriter to answer. Um, if it's nights or weekends, you have all of this at your fingertips. And I think that as a loan officer, it is just so, so, so important to familiarize yourself with the HUD handbook how to find the guidelines, um, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So um, one, one way to get to the site is just to scan the QR code on your screen. That'll take you right there, but that's going to be on your phone. Um, so here's how you do it on your computer, and I do it, um, I'm going to give you guys this recording, so uh, maybe just follow along for now, but then go back and try this if you're not sure how to get to those um, so HUD housing handbook is what you can type into Google It's probably going to be the first thing that pops up on your screen make sure it's HUD.gov because that's how you know it's the legitimate HUD um, guidelines, and it's going to take you to this screen, um, a lot of people refer to the HUD handbook as the 4001 that's this here. Um, but this is the site that you want to bookmark, even though we're actually going to click on this link and open the PDF. That's not the site that I want you to bookmark. I want you to bookmark this page because they're always going to post the most recent version of the HUD handbook right here. And if you save the next screen, which is the PDF, a couple of months from now, that's going to be outdated. So save this page, and then you're going to uh, click here to view the most recent version of the 4001 PDF, and it's going to open um, the 4001, and you're going to notice this is a lot of pages. This is 1,524 pages right now. Um, there's no way that we have these page numbers memorized or know exactly where to find them. There is a hand in, handy dandy trick that you can do with any PDF, a lot of you know, is on a PC, just hold down the control button on your keyboard, press F as in find, it'll pop up a search box that looks like this, and you can type in absolutely anything you want, but be as specific as possible. You don't want to type out a whole sentence because this is going to be searching exact matches only. So you want to be as vague as possible so that you that so that it does find what you're looking for. Um, quick example, I had a loan officer text me the other day. So this is just the first thing is popping in my head, but there's tons of examples of this that said, hey, a, a, um, a, a, man, a HUD underwriter is telling me that there is a hundred mile requirement to use rental income on an FHA loan on the home that they are departing. So if they're moving out of their primary right now, buying another one, um, they were like, the underwriters telling me they have to be hundred miles. Is that a real HUD guideline? So you actually don't have to reach out to your AEs on this. If you have this saved, 
um, you can find out the real answer to that question and know that it's 100% correct by just typing in, for example, 100 miles into the search bar here. And you'll see that HUD has searched for this and they've found seven places that the HUD handbook says 100 miles. You can just click down here and it'll go to the all see all instances that it pops up and you can see that is an actual HUD guideline so HUD says that if rental income is being derived from the property being vacated by the borrower they have to be re relocating 100 miles from their current principal residence so this takes the mystery out of you guys wondering if underwriters are lying to you or if it's an overlay you can look this up yourself so this is huge 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 and what we're going to be going over the rest of the call is HUD guidelines on manuals. So which loans are manuals? Um, you can go to the HUD handbook. It'll tell you, I'm gonna blow it up, make it bigger here for you. The HUD handbook says that we have to manually underwrite every file where it is a refer in DU or LP or in instances that we're required to downgrade. And we are gonna look at those because you may not have those memorized. So. One of those two situations, you get a refer in DU, that's a manual underwrite automatically. And there's certain situations we're gonna look at that require a manual, even though you got an approve eligible. So this is the one you guys uh, probably cringe when you see this, but if DU gives you a refer, you're gonna get a message that says it's been referred because the risk exceeds the threshold. Basically what that means is it's DU is looking at all the risk factors, you know, DTI, LTV, credit score, all that good stuff and saying, uh, okay, we're not, this is not a risk that's going to get an automated approval. So what that means in that case is you have to know the HUD guidelines on manuals. So we will go um, into that in greater detail, but there's also a few situations where HUD is going to require a manual, even though you got an approve eligible. And let's look at those. So this is straight from the HUD handbook. Um, number one, it just says anything that DU cannot read. So DU can read the credit. It can read, uh, obviously it knows the DTI, it knows the LTV, it knows if there's a gift, but some things that can't read and really the major one that pops into my head is insufficient funds on bank statements. So if you guys are giving us uh, your bank statements and there are overdrafts on there, that is something DU obviously knows nothing about and it would require that the underwriter manually downgrade and we have to meet the manual guidelines. Um, uh, this one is a big one, the hundred, the thousand dollars or more in disputed derogatory. We're gonna look at that in greater detail. Um, also, you guys are probably aware that we need three years for foreclosure, short sale, deed and lieu. Anything inside three years would be a manual. Um, and then the, the housing obligations, mortgage payment history, that means that if the, if the borrower's got, let's say, more than three 30-day lates uh, on a mortgage in the last uh, 24 months, or they've got a 60-day late and a 30-day late on a mortgage, if you actually were to click on this link, HUD would tell you when this would be required, but multiple mortgage lates in the last uh, year or so is going to require a manual downgrade. Also, what is undisclosed mortgage debt that would require a manual? That means that uh, a credit, a, a mortgage trade line is not reporting on credit. And let's say that mortgage trade line, we get the VOM and it has lates, that is going to require a manual downgrade. Um, and then anytime a self-employed borrower has business income that is declining 20% or more over the most recent year, uh, that is going to require a manual downgrade. But again, the most common one that I see is a downgrade because of the thousand dollars or more in disputed, dis <laughs> disputed derogatory accounts. And so here's a sample credit report for you on the screen. So all credit reports look different, but a lot of them have a, a spot where it will show you the number of disputes. So when you're looking at a credit report, you've got your approve eligible, you think you're good. Always check for disputed accounts. And if you see some, um, then we need to look at them and see if they are over that $1,000 threshold. Um, why does HUD require a manual downgrade with disputed accounts? I get that question all the time. The reason is because when a borrower disputes something on their credit report, the credit score is not reflecting that trade line that's, that's disputed. So if it's a derogatory account, a collection or late, um, really the score would be lower if it were not disputed. So because the score is artificially inflated when the borrower 
disputes derogatory accounts, that is when HUD, that's why HUD says, okay, our approve eligible may not even be a real approve eligible because it's not even looking at the right credit score. So that is why when the borrower has a thousand or more dollars in disputed derogatory accounts, we have to downgrade it. So quick example of that, um, this is on a credit report. You can see that this is a disputed account. It says account disputed by consumer. It's over a thousand dollar balance. This has to be a manual underwrite, even though they got an approve eligible on this file. By the way, you can omit um, medical from that thousand dollar calculation. So what are the credit requirements for manuals? This is when you, you run the DU, you get a refer. This is one of the first things that you need to check out. So this one's a big one, installment and housing accounts. So for the past 12 months on all installment or housing, they can have zero lates. So no 30-day lates allowed in the past 12 months on installment. What is installment? That's auto, that's um, student loans. Housing is going to be obviously a mortgage or their 12 months rent that's in the file. So no more, no lates at all in the past 12 months. And then the year prior, they can have up to two 30-day lates, but no 60s. And they could not have three 30-day lates. And that is a total. So when you're looking at all installment accounts that have lates, the total has to be three times 30 or less in the past 24 months. Also, no non-medical collections or charge-offs on installment accounts in the past 24 months. So if they had auto lates and they ended up having a charge-off on an auto loan, that cannot be any time in the past two years uh, with a manual underwrite. On revolving accounts, this is obviously credit cards, then the HUD is a lot more flexible. Um, so they will let, they only do a 12 months look back on credit cards and you're capped at three times 60. So you can see they're a lot more flexible, um, but they don't want any lates over 90 days on a credit card in the past year. And then collections and charge offs for revolving accounts, like if they have a credit card that's been charged off, that could not have happened in the past year. So we're doing a 24 month look back on installment and housing, and we're doing a 12 month look back on revolving. So I'm just putting at the bottom of the screen just exactly what we went over, but I want to show you some snippets from credit reports, and you guys tell me um, if if this is acceptable or not. So here, here's the first one. I'll give you a second to check that out. But what we have is a collection from Sprint, like a cell phone or, or phone internet service, and it is uh, date of last activity, we're showing 3-1-23 is the date opened, I'm sorry. So this is a um, collection from Sprint that hit their credit two months ago. Is that okay for a manual? And the answer to that is no. Now I get a lot of these similar situations where they have paid the account. See this balance shows $643 balance. What if they paid it? Uh, does not matter if they paid it. Even if this showed that they had paid that collection, um, it wouldn't change anything. So they cannot have had that account opened, that collection opened in the past 24 months on, on an installment account like this or a utility. So let's take a look at this one. Um, this one, we these are both installment. You can see that on the credit report here. It would say revolving if they were revolving. Uh, these are installment. And you may look here and say, oh, we're good. That's the 30-day lace are, are two years out. But this over here, you have to total these up. So we actually have more than two times 30 in the past 24 months right here because we have uh, you know, at least four. Um, then we're not meeting this guideline here. So this is also not okay on a manual underwrite. And then let's take a look at this one. These are student loans, so they are installment, and it looks like they were charged off or sent to collection. Uh, I, actually, they wouldn't be charged off, but they went to collection um, a couple of years ago. So those are outside of 24 months. So technically, you're okay on that since we're doing a 24-month look back. If I saw this on a credit report, I would just um, hope that they are uh, have a clear cavers because obviously FHA won't allow you 
to proceed with an FHA loan if you have a caver's head. If you guys are wondering what that is, um, follow me on social media. I had a recent post on cavers and what that means for FHA loans on um, TikTok and Instagram. So check it out. It's down here at the bottom of the screen at behind closed loans. Um, but as long as we're pulling a clear, a clear cavers and um, you, th those are either paid or they've been making payments for the cavers, then we're good to go. What about this one? So this one, um, they have a installment, which uh, this is an auto account that um, has a late 221, 30 day late. So just outside of two years. And then this is medical. And as we said, medical is always okay. So if it says medical, you're good, keep moving. But um, in this, this is the only other thing on question on this credit and it is outside two years. So this one would actually be okay as well. So waiting periods, these are actually not specific to manuals, but just general HUD guidelines. Deed and lieu, foreclosure, short sale, you're gonna need three years. Chapter seven, bankruptcy, you need two years. And then chapter 13, um, they can actually be in a chapter 13 per HUD guidelines, as long as they've made at least 12 payments in the bankruptcy and have the VK court's permission. So what if they had an auto late January, 2023, and we're saying it was an extenuating circumstance and needs an exception. So we're gonna look at that. What if they had a um, foreclosure two years ago, this not three years out and borrowers said it was an extenuating circumstance. So here's what we need on that. This is super important as loan officers, you've got to learn this stuff. Um, I actually have a, a social media post on this as well that my posts, by the way, are usually like five seconds long. They're not very long, but I try to put some tips on there. So if an extenuating circumstance to qualify for um, uh, as an exception, then here's what you have to have. And you have to meet all of this, not one, not part of it, everything that I'm going to say, because these are very, very, very rare that a borrower meets these requirements. And I cannot stress that enough. It is, uh, when I get one of these where they actually are meeting everything required, it is rare, but it does happen. So here's what needs to happen. So um, this has to be isolated. So if we're looking at their credit report and we see lates all through, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, all the way up till now, that you're not gonna say to an underwriter, well, this was an extenuating circumstance, no. So an extenuating circumstance means that they had great credit before this happened and they've had perfect credit after this has happened, but this was um, something that was not normal for the borrower. And that's what we're gonna be looking for. So we should not see pickups on credit over many years, it should look really good. We should see, okay, this happened. This is not normal for that borrower. And then they're now they're paying things on time. That looks and smells like an extenuating circumstance. Um, like it has to be clearly defined to one moment in time. Also, you're gonna have to document the extenuating circumstance. And a letter of explanation is not enough. You cannot just tell us what happened. You have to prove it. Um, so if the borrower says they lost their job, we need to, we need to see their, um, the, the letter. We need to see that they were um, collecting unemployment. We need to see it documented. Um, as you guys know, this is never going to work if they just said, I forgot, or um, my finances got away from me, or even unfortunately divorce is not an extenuating circumstance either. Um, this is a big one. So whatever we're saying caused that derogatory on credit um, needs to have happened very close in time frame to um, the cause. So if somebody says that they lost their job, then the lates need to be closely related to that. So if, if somebody says that their spouse passed away um, and that's why they had a late on their car payment because they were missing that income, then we would need the death certificate. And then the auto late should be right after that death or very close um, within three months. So make sure those cannot be years apart. And believe it or not, we get a lot of loans in where somebody says this caused this, but they're you know literally 18 months apart. That's not gonna work. We cannot tie those together. 
So you have to have a letter of explanation with an extenuating circumstance, and I'm going to show you how to do it. So it needs three parts. They can still be short. This is a half a page long. We don't need a novel, but they need to, number one, tell us what happened that was outside of the borrower's control, and you need dates. If they say, I lost my job, we need to know when. If they say their um, spouse had an ongoing medical Ill illness, you know, you, you please give us the dates so that we can match it up with what happened on credit. What did they do to try to make it right or get caught up? We want to see some effort. You know, we want to know they're financially responsible. So tell us what effort they put in to not have that late or not have that um, foreclosure. And number three is very important. What is different now to keep that situation from happening again? What have they changed? So a sample letter of explanation, um, five years with the same company. I was laid off July, 2022. So we're, we're saying what happened and we're saying when. Um, and then we wanna, we, here's what this person did. My financial responsibilities are very important to me. So I called the creditor to attempt to work out a payment plan while I look for a new job. They were not able to help. My car payment was late August, 2022. So here's what they did to try to remedy this situation. But unfortunately um, they were late. And what are we doing different now? I learned from this experience. Now I set aside two months of car payments to prevent a similar situation from occurring again. So here's what we're checking as lenders. So this means this was what you need to check. We need to see that the job loss date that they put in this letter matches the loan application, the written VOE. It needs to match everything in the file. If it doesn't match up with the file, we're already in trouble. You're already... Uh, losing points here. So make sure everything matches up, all the dates match up with the file. Also, we need to see that the auto date that they're talking about matches up with the credit. So always check that. And then we're saying now that uh, the borrower sets aside two months of car payments to prevent a similar situation. So when we get the bank statements in, those need to match up. If they don't, then you know, you're throwing your explanation out the window. So just your job as a loan officer to check all of this stuff. Um, so housing history, here is what HUD requires for housing or rent. And we just need one of these, not all of them, whichever one. So we, if, if the mortgage history is on credit, we have no lates in the last 12 months, you're good to go. Um, we can get, you can get a credit supplement for the rent if they're renting. Obviously we wanna see no lates on the rent. Um, or you can get a VOR. Um, believe it or not, a private VOR that's not done through a management company is actually okay with Orion as long as it's not a family member that they're renting from and they're not renting from the seller because obviously there's a conflict of interest there. Or cancel checks for the rent or um, they can be rent-free even with a manual underwriting. So if they are living with a family member rent-free, we would need a letter from the family member, not from the borrower. Rent-free letters do not come from the borrower. We get those in all the time. That won't work. So you, your rent-free letter has to come from and be signed by the owner of the property that they're staying in. So reserve requirements. Um, HUD is going to require one month reserves on single family and duplexes. So after closing, um, they need to have one month of the PITI on our subject property still left over in the bank. Um, they cannot have no reserves at all with a manual. That's a HUD guideline. If it's a three to four unit, then they need three months left over after closing. So DTI, this is a big one. And this is a, um, uh, an area where a lot of lenders have overlays. We don't. So I'm showing you this straight from the HUD handbook. Um, by the way, uh, a cheat to get to this chart in the HUD handbook is in the little search engine, um, when you hit control F to pop up the find box, type in 40 forward slash 50, because there's only one place in the HUD handbook that says that exactly. And that is this DTI chart, because the absolute max that HUD allows on the DTI on a manual is 40 on the front on the housing payment and 50 on the back with all other uh, liabilities included. So um, remember we talked about our one overlay, we will not do manuals under a 580, HUD does. So HUD says that if the score is under 580, the DTI is capped at 3143, no exceptions. And um, if you're doing a no score loan, we do allow no score. So Orion does those, we're gonna talk about what's required on that. 
It is also 3143, no exceptions. And HUD says that on a no score loan, you cannot use a non occupying co borrower, somebody that's not going to be living in the property, to DTI qualify. That is only with a no score. That obviously does not apply in other situations, but I like to point that out. Um, so if they have a 580 and up and it's a manual with no compensating factors, we can go up to 3143. If they have one of these compensating factors, HUD allows up to 3747. If the mortgage is their only debt, um, then it's capped at 40 over 50. And here's what these comp factors, if you were to scroll down in the HUD handbook, which I do encourage you guys to do that, um, it'll tell you what these mean. And verified and documented cash drawers, in order for it to be a compensating factor, it has to be three months. So HUD requires one month reserves on every manual underwrite, just right out of the gate. But if you're trying to go above 3143, up to 47, 3747, then what they're talking about uh, uh, reserves as a comp factor is actually three months to be a comp factor. Um, also, a compensating factor would be a minimal increase in their housing payment. Uh, that would be wherever they're currently renting or if they have a current mortgage, HUD is looking for the lesser of a $100 increase or a 5% increase. Obviously, if they're rent-free, you can't use that one or residual income being met. And HUD actually uses the VA calculation for residual income. You can Google that. There's some calculators out there. It's basically how much the borrower has left over after monthly obligations and bills are paid. Um, so if the mortgage is the only um, liability is 40 over 40, um, the absolute max is 40 over 50. So HUD will never allow on a manual the front end housing to go over 40, it cannot be 40.01. It has to be 40 or lower. And then the back end, 50.00000. That's the best case scenario with two comp factors. And the only additional comp factor that HUD allowed uh, added here, because these are just the same as up here, is significant additional income not reflected in our income calculation. So let's say the borrower started getting overtime 11 months ago, and we don't have 12 months, so we can't use it in the income calculation, we can use it as a comp factor. It has to be our borrower's income. So we can't use the fact that they're married and their spouse who is not on our loan, we can't use that as a comp factor. It has to be income coming from an actual borrower on our loan. I cannot stress this enough. If you're doing a manual underwrite, include a loan officer cover letter. Underwriters are not mind readers. Um, they, they can't, they, there's no way for them to know sometimes what you're trying to use as the comp factors. So spell it out for them in a very short, brief uh, cover letter that says, hey, my DTI on this I'm calculating is 38 um, over 48. I know I need two comp factors. I'm using three months reserves and they're decreasing their housing payment. Just put it in a bullet point. We read those cover letters. Definitely tell the underwriter what you're doing on your file. So no score loans, those are going to be automatically manuals. We do those. Here's what HUD wants special for a no score. They need three sources of non-traditional credit. Um, we need to see documented over 12 months. Um, it can be canceled checks. It can be, um, we're, we're really open on the documentation, but we need something solid showing on-time payments for 12 months. Um, one of the three should be something major, like rent. If they're rent-free, then maybe their phone service their car insurance, a uh, utility bill, something like that. We don't want to see all three non-traditional uh, be like, you know, $9.99 from Spotify and, and you know, $14.99 for Netflix. Uh, something in there needs to be substantial. Um, the most common that we see are going to be insurance, child care, those kind of things, other than, of course, the, the, the main that we see are the um, cell phone, car insurance, utility, and of course, rent if they're paying rent. Those are probably our preferences. And you can add these to credit to reduce the documentation that we would need if you don't want the underwriter saying, hey, you didn't put the URL at the bottom and going back and forth. You can just get these added to the credit report and that gives us the documentation that we need without the hassle. Are gift funds allowed on um, manuals. Uh, yes, they are. So per regular HUD guidelines, you can get a gift with a manual as well. 
for down payment and closing costs. One thing that's different about a manual is that um, you cannot use excess gift funds as reserves on a manual. You may not know this, but you can actually do that if it's not a manual. So if you're getting an approved eligible, it's not a manual underwrite, um, and the gift needed is only 20,000, but you're putting 30,000 in there as the gift um, and using the rest as reserves, you actually can do that on an approved eligible. HUD does not allow that on a manual.